And part of the course is to study the nuclear fuel cycle, and that involves starting with uranium mining and milling, working through conversion into forms of uranium that can be used in nuclear facilities, and and then ultimately the uranium is for a reactor, but if it, the reactor may use enriched uranium, in which case the uranium has to be enriched. Um, and then in, in any case, it has to be fabricated, whether it's enriched or natural, into fuel and then put in the reactor. And then the um, fuel is irradiated. And today what I'd like to do is concentrate on the reactor part of this fuel cycle. And, and after the fuel um, comes out of the reactor, for this course, we mostly worry about it in terms of its potential use in weapons. And that, and then if you look on the left side, the, after it comes out of the reactor, in this, in this diagram, it's a heavy water reactor. Um, it would then the fuel would be chemically processed, plutonium separated, and then the plutonium could be used in nuclear weapons. What I'd like to do today is, is cover some basics on nuclear reactors and then talk about the plutonium that's produced in them. And, and that will end today. Or I'd like you to just do some simple calculations um, of plutonium production. That gives you a kind of an order of magnitude look at, the, in a sense, the threat posed by the reactors we worry about in non in nonproliferation cases. Now, in a general sense, a nuclear reactor is, is just a machine. Um, and it's a very dangerous machine because of the radioactivity involved. But it's really just a machine um, in which fissile material, plutonium uh, or enriched uranium or natural uranium, can be made to undergo a controlled self-sustaining nuclear reaction with the, the lease of energy. And so we talked about these things before. Um, but the main idea is, is, is that it's got to be controlled. It's not a nuclear weapon where, f where it's uncontrolled. And the, and the fissions just continue um, multiplying exponentially. But here you want to actually have it under, under control, where if you had a fission produce two neutrons, only one of those neutrons would produce another fission. And, then all, and so in that sense, you're having a continuous number of fissions, but it's not the numbers are not growing exponentially as they would in a nuclear explosion. Now, the basic parts of a reactor um, are the the fuel region, which is in the center, and that's marked by red in the figure. Then there's the heat removal equipment because again, the main output of this is energy, essentially heat is what, what comes out of a reactor. And you want to be able to extract the heat or remove it, depending on what the purpose of the reactor is. And in this case, on the right, you see it's a heat exchanger is the general term. And there, the, the whatever is cooling the reactor, whether it's a liquid or a gas, uh, is heated as it flows through the core or the fuel region. And then this heat exchanger works with, it would be water from the outside, and then the heat would be transferred to that secondary cooling system and produce steam um, or hot water. And then you have to have a control system, which is represented here by control rods that can be inserted in the reactor. And, and if, they're all, if they're inserted all the way, the reactor is shut down. And then as you pull them out, um, you can start the chain reaction and, the, and then have a controlled nuclear reaction. Behind that is very sophisticated equipment, um, particularly nowadays, to control the safety of the reactor, to monitor what's going on inside the core, to be able to institute or start safety systems or emergency systems if there is an accident. So the control system is defined very broadly and is very sophisticated. In the old days, it was pretty simple. Um, and there were lots of, of um, incidents that, that led to radioactive releases. Um, those obviously have come down, but they haven't been eliminated if you think of the Fukushima accident. That there you have an unexpected event that caused um, failures in the equipment that were not expected and the, and the control system could not, could not control, um, in that case, the heat generated 
uh, by the reactor after it was shut down. Because again, once the fuel is irradiated, it produces fission products, and those fission products are gonna go through radioactive decay and generate more heat. So even once a reactor started and run for a while, even if it's shut down, it generates heat. And that was really the problem at Fukushima, was they trying to get rid of that excess heat. And, and, it, and as, as that accident shows, it can get quite hot if you're not continuously cooling it. Um, you also have to have a refueling capability. And I showed pictures in the Young Beyond reactor where the fueling machine comes out over a bunch of channels in the reactor top and pulls the fuel out. Um, you can have a, a kind of a pop top that you have in modern light water reactors, for example. You big heavy top, you take it off, and then you pull out these very long fuel assemblies. Um, and you do it maybe once a year, once every 18 months, and you take out maybe one third of the core. But anyway, you have to have the equipment in place to do that. Reactors have many purposes. Um, I think the one we're most familiar with is that they generate electricity. That's what you see when you look at these, or, or what, what's going on when you look at these big domes associated with commercial nuclear power reactors. And, and they typically are going to do that by producing heat um, via st or steam, essentially, from the heat. And the steam would then uh, spin a turbine. They also, um, the heat can be used um, to generate steam that's pushed through neighborhoods. I mean, the this, this Soviet Union did that. You still see the pipes in some places where the steam was just carried um, into homes and heated homes was used in industry. Um, reactors are also used to produce isos isotopes for medical, industrial, or research purposes. And they're also used just to conduct basic research. Um, they're also used to propel ships such as uh, icebreakers or nuclear-powered submarines. But the, um, the reactor offers a benefit of, of it doesn't have to be refueled very often. And also, if, if you're in a submarine and you have a diesel engine, that diesel engine is going to produce carbon dioxide, which has to be gotten rid of. And often, diesel submarines have to come up to the surface to vent the excess carbon dioxide where a nuclear-powered submarine can stay submerged for very long periods of time. Now, on the military side, and we've talked about this some, is it, they're, they're, and, and they were really developed for this purpose originally, was to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. Uh, it turned out you could also use them to produce tritium for nuclear weapons. And that aspect of the reactor was developed several years, several years into the Cold War. And then I mentioned you can use them in nuclear submarines. One more exotic is you use is you could use them to propel aircraft and, and rockets. And that, that was looked into of you could you have an, have a, a reactor that it, it, it would in a, in essence eject matter that could be used for space travel. And and there were or and there were other ideas too to actually take a rocket and throw a nuclear weapon, have a lot of nuclear weapons on board and you throw one out. And, the, and, and it would go off and then propel you into space. And so they looked at how do you create the, the proper surface so that you can, you can actually get this rocket moving. And, um, but it was done very seriously. It was in the heyday of, of, of nuclear weapons development in the 50s where anything was, was possible to look at. And obviously, some of these uses, um, um, particularly the in, in aircraft, I mean, you, you're going to end up generating huge amounts of radioactivity. And in the 50s, when they were conducting all kinds of atmospheric nuclear weapons tests, that didn't look so bad. But, but by anybody's modern standards, it, it would be completely unacceptable. Now, there's several types of reactors, and this is related to the purpose of them. And, and but the terminology is important to know. The power reactor is really is a term that uh, implies a typically civilian reactor that its main purpose is to generate electricity. And they're going to in in the, the reactor is typically going to make a lot of reactor grade plutonium. If that's plutonium that has quite a bit of this plutonium 240 in it, 
I think it was greater than 20% or so, plutonium-240. Um, so it's very far from weapon-grade plutonium, which had only 7% plutonium-240. And part of the reason for that is, is that if you're going to produce electricity, you're going to be doing it based on a, a kind of an economic imperative. You want to do it as cheaply as possible. And it turns out when you create these reactors, you want to use the uranium and keep the uranium in the reactor as long as possible. And that means that you're going to, when you make plutonium, it's going to start turning into lower and lower quality plutonium as, as you keep the fuel in longer and longer. Uh, research reactors, I, I don't know if you've ever been in one. I mean, there, there are not so many anymore in the United States. Um, when I was a kid, they were all over the place. And, uh, and the United States exported a lot of them. And the idea is those are used for research reactors. Research is the primary need. But it's, they're also used to produce isotopes, medical isotopes, for example. And so um, today, a lot of the medical diagnostic methods depend on medical isotopes produced in research reactors. And there, there's actually a uh, potential shortage in these reactors to make these isotopes. And one of them, it's called molybdenum-99, decays into technetium-99, which is used in, in a very common radioactive um, detection system. You see it where you, you take it in, you ingest a little bit, and that allows um, with you, uh, medical equipment be able to detect soft tissue very accurately and used uh, you know, daily in all the major hospitals. From a nonproliferation point of view, civilian research reactors um, have come up because they can be misused to make plutonium for nuclear weapons. Or it can actually be a, a reactor that's intended to make weapon-grade plutonium um, as its primary purpose, but it's called a research reactor. And so in some sense, a research reactor is viewed as just a small reactor. It doesn't produce much power. Uh, and um, and and often is has a legitimate civil use. In fact, most cases, but in some cases, it's just a cover, or it's um, it's a capability, it, it, a latent capability. Uh, Iraq had a couple research reactors in the 80s. One bought from Russia, one bought from France. There was highly enriched uranium fuel associated with it. Um, after Saddam invaded Kuwait in 1990 and was, and was surprised by the strong international reaction. He, he launched a crash program, and, and he ordered that the safeguarded highly enriched uranium for these research reactors be diverted and, and, and turned into material for use in a nuclear weapon. And so there it was. They, the Iraqis always knew they had this potential. In a pinch, they could they could take this safeguarded material from a civilian research reactor and try to make it into bomb material. The third type is propulsion reactors, which we're not going to talk about here, and the fourth type is production reactors, which really are are built um, to make plutonium and tritium for nuclear weapons. Now, the types vary greatly, and uh, I'll bring in some of these ideas. Last week, we talked about the Young Beyond reactor, which is a gas graphite reactor, which means it's cooled by carbon dioxide, and, it, and, the, and the nuclear reaction is moderated by graphite. And so that's a particular type. Um, and the, that type of reactor is pretty easy to build. It's a 50s technology. And so it's not surprising that that's the first thing North Korea tried to build. Um, and so in general, production reactors and research reactors are the simplest to build. And the and, um, additional feature of a graphite reactor is it uses natural uranium as a, as a heavy water reactor does. And so you can bypass the need to build an enrichment plant or to obtain low enriched uranium or highly enriched uranium to run it. And again, the graphite and heavy water moderate reactors with using natural uranium fuel or the, have been the preferred reactors of, of what we call the proliferant states. And, they, and the goal was to make plutonium for weapons. 
Now, commercial reactors, these power reactors, are going to use low enriched uranium, typically. And, and they have um, much more advanced control and safety systems. They involve materials that are much harder to work with, and they're just more difficult to actually make uh, than production reactors or research reactors. Yeah, Henry, what is it? Um, it's, if you could talk more about research reactors, in what ways are they different, e.g. size, cost, whatnot? Uh, let me come back to that when I, I'm going to. Um... Yeah, and when you do, he, he's particularly interested in the Tehran reactor. OK, all right. What I'd like to do now is, and I'm going to do this fairly quickly. Um, go through three types of reactors, the or production reactors, research reactors, and then power reactors. And what I'll do is I'll probably, I'm going to plan to skip over the power reactors. There, there's pictures of them in the slides, and, 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 and I'll leave that to you to look at. Production reactors, from a proliferation point of view, are really the, the, the main thing to understand. I mean, one of the other phenomena that happens with proliferant states is they're not using cutting edge nuclear technology unless they can buy it. They'll, and we'll cover that in, when we talk about enrichment plants, particularly gas centrifuge plants where they, they were able to be able to buy it. It also meant they had to have very, a lot of access to classified information in order to pull it off. So they'll do that if they can. But for reactors where they've had to typically build them on their own um, or were able to get them back in the 50s under Adams for Peace, getting fairly simple ones from supplier states, but they, they weren't able um, to get the more advanced ones. And so, but the, the bottom line is the production reactors are, are a good model to, to try to figure out uh, plutonium production for proliferant states. Now, the original type of production reactors I mean, were building the nuclear weapon states. And the, again, to get plutonium for weapons, um, none of those are, are operational. I mean, the, the ones that we would call production reactors today are the ones, very small ones, in, in Israel, India, and Pakistan. And um, India will sometimes call them a uh, research reactors, but, but even after their 1998 test, that, that designation kind of dropped away. Most of them were designed to use natural uranium fuel. Um, the enrichment plants that existed back then were dedicated to making weapon-grade uranium for nuclear weapons, not to make low-enriched uranium, at least initially. Over time, um, some of the production reactors were shifted over from natural uranium to highly rich uranium fuel. They decided for various reasons that that, that would be um, in their interest. Again, the fuel was simple, often uranium metal, which is easier to make than uranium oxide fuel. Um, if you think about um, uranium oxide, it's when you make it, it's actually like a ceramic. So you have to turn this uranium oxide powder um, you, you have to kind of compact it and then bake it and, and turn it into an ox uh, ceramic. Um, if the goal is to make plutonium, you then have to be, and the plutonium is produced in the ceramic, um, then you have to be able to dissolve it, chemically dissolve it to extract the plutonium. And that's very difficult to do. I mean, and compared to just taking uranium metal, um, and dissolving that, which is which is pretty simple to do. And so the original fuels were, were essentially all metal. And they and the cooling has been done by water, carbon dioxide, or in one case I'll point out even air. And the moder moderators are typically typically graphite or heavy water. Also, some produced electricity. I mean, that, they weren't. While well, that was not a priority, they would they would hook these things up to an electrical grid if. If it was in their interest, it would create, in a sense, some income. Um, and and it, with the Yongbyon reactor, 
um, you saw the turbine, or those who were here last week saw the turbine building where they, that reactor does produce some electricity. A quick question for Henry. Uh, given the choice of unlimited resources, would the state desire to fuel a reactor with CGU, or why would they start with a natural uh, uranium unless they have to? Um, that's really, I think that's part of it, is what they can, it's a combination of what they can build and the resources they have at hand. Um, let me just show some reactors. I mean, this is the first reactor, the Hanford B reactor, um, made, I th if I'm correct, made the plutonium for the Nagasaki and Trinity devices. And it was a graphite moderated water cooled natural uranium metal fuel reactor. And it, you know, that's for production reactors, that's not an atypical shape. It's, and that's also how the, in a way, that's what the North Korean reactor looked like. Um, different cooling, but the same same moderation. Um, here it is set within the complex where the big long building on the left um, would be the reprocessing plant, where the plutonium would be separated. Now here's the face of the core. It's a little hard to see this, but it um, the fuel goes in horizontally, and literally this reactor was so simple that if you look on the right side, people would just push the fuel in on one side. It would travel down the, through the core, get irradiated, plutonium would be produced in it, and then as more fuel was pushed in, eventually it would come out and be pushed out the other end and drop into a cooling pool where it would cool for a certain amount of time and then be taken off to the reprocessing plant to separate the plutonium. There are not many safety features. I mean, the cooling water came in and out. At that time, it came straight from the Columbia River into the reactor and out to the reactor. The fuel is primitive, so the, it's, the uranium metal is encased in a metal, aluminum in this case. It would crack. There would be a leakage of fission products, and so the Columbia River became pretty radioactive during this period. And, and this is when they started to realize the danger of this is when they started to come up with secondary cooling systems so that the water drawn from the Columbia River was not, was not flowing through the reactor core and picking up a lot of fission products. But that's about as simple as you can get. And that was, that, that was used by several countries. The, the French had the G2 and the G3 reactors essentially um, um, same design. It's a little harder to see that here, but here's the face. There's people here, and there's a, a I, I don't know, this may not have been done by hand as it was originally, but it may have been done by machine, but it's the same idea. The fuel comes in one side and it's just pushed through as more fuel is introduced. Control rods are on the top. This is the platform to, I think, to control the fuel, the control rods. Uh, another quick question. So the fuel is naturally Natural uranium, yeah. So then what, what are they using to irradiate it? I'm sorry? What are they irradiating? Yeah. Well, they, 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 there's enough natural uranium in there that it starts a chain so reaction. So it's just natural uranium to natural uranium. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the natural uranium, the U-235 in the natural uranium yeah. is fissioning. Okay. And so you have enough. This is Initially, this is filled with natural uranium. Okay. So you would fill all the channels with natural uranium, and you'd have enough in there that you can then you can inject some neutrons and start the chain reaction. Yeah, no, I, that's I forgot to mention that. So you fill the reactor and then and then you start the chain reaction. And then as you refuel it, you're just pushing fuel in and that pushes uh, the other fuel out. But a very simple idea. Um, here's a uh, another picture of the G2. Let me skip that. Um, G2. Well, um, it says it is. The G1 actually was cooled by air. That it, it, it um, just used air from outside to cool it. It was a very small reactor. It was the first French one. These, this is pictures of the Savannah River product, uh, Savannah River production reactor. Um, not much to look at. It was heavy water moderated. Here's a picture of the core. The, the pipes were pumping in or, uh, or taking out heavy water that was going through the reactor. The core, in this case, is vertical. Um, 
and so the, the fuel um, was inserted vertically and then taken out. And in this, I have more here. In this case, the, they started with natural uranium, but they decided that, that it was better to start using a, what's called a target driver system. The idea is, is that if you have a core of natural uranium, it's the uranium-235 is distributed everywhere in the core. And, and the idea was, well, why don't we concentrate the U-235 with, in, in highly enriched uranium fuel rods, and then in essence free up space where you could stick targets. And, and the targets were two types. One is they'd be depleted uranium, um, which has a lot of uranium-238 in it. And, and if you remember, neutrons hit the uranium-238, it's what makes plutonium. And so the, you would create the space for the ura depleted uranium, uranium-238. And so the neutrons produced in the drivers elements from the fission of U-235 would irradiate the U-238 and make plutonium in the targets. And, and the targets could be, um, could be processed pretty simply. But there was another advantage, which probably was more involved in doing this. As nuclear weapons got more advanced in the 40s and 50s, they wanted tritium. Uh, they wanted for something called a boosted fission weapon, which the idea there is that you have a compression of the core, say of plutonium or weapon-grade uranium, you start the chain reaction, and then that chain reaction um, actually ignites um, thermonuclear material, deuterium and tritium, inside the core at the center. And that creates fusion, and that creates a lot more neutrons. And those neutrons then fission a lot more of the plutonium than would actually be fissioned by the nuclear or the atomic explosion. So that's why it's called you're boosting the yield. And when it was done right, you could have, if you didn't have this boosting going on, you could have maybe a half a kiloton explosion. Uh, if you, once the boosting happened, you could have three, four kilotons. So you could get a tremendous magnification of the, of the yield from the boosting. And so all US weapons started to use uh, tritium. So they'd be boosted. And, um, and it turned out, well, you, you need to have a driver target system to do that. They tried to make tritium in the B reactor at Hanford, and they were able to make some, but it wasn't very efficient. But with this system at Savannah River, where they create this space for targets, they could put in the target material for tritium is lithium-6, and they can put that in, and, and then the neutrons from the driver rods irradiate the lithium and make tritium. And so they could either be making weapon-grade plutonium or tritium in these reactors. The second type I'd like to talk about are research reactors. And, and Henry, this is where we can try to deal with your question to the extent that I can. Uh, I may have to get back to you if it's too technical. But um, like production reactors, the design and construction of research reactors is, is pretty straightforward. Um, and some are similar to production reactors. The, and they're certainly far simpler to build than, than power reactors. And they can be fueled with low enriched uranium or highly enriched uranium. And, and that many can be used to make plutonium via this uh, driver target system. I mentioned the Iraqi reactors. They were using highly enriched uranium fuel. One of the things they did early in their program is they actually put targets in one of them. It was the Russian one to, make, to start making plutonium secretly so they could start to study it, to see how do you separate it, what are the properties. Um, and, the, and that was not detected by the International Atomic Energy Agency. They don't, particularly back then, they weren't really looking for it. And the safeguard systems were not set up to detect that kind of production. North Korea did it too. They had a Russian supply research reactor. Their first plutonium was produced in that reactor in, in a target and then separated. Um, at a nearby facility. In fact, one of the ones you saw in the video last week, those of you who are here. And, and that video is on, our, on the website if you want to see it. I'm sorry? I can send out the link. Okay.
Yeah, here's a, this isn't the greatest picture, but this, this is not, this is kind of typical for a research reactor. You're gonna see a big pool of water and the, and the core is down inside it. Doesn't have, um, to, it doesn't have a lot of containment domes or reactor vessels or anything. It's very, pretty simple. And then this, the equipment on top would be to take the reactor fuel out or the targets. Um, yeah, here's an outside view of the Tehran research reactor. Um, again, this isn't a very, well, this is not a very big reactor, but it, it's, um, it's right in the center of Tehran. And um, they actually can have pretty serious accidents. So you do worry about the safety of this reactor. And, and, there, and one of the reasons we don't have so many anymore, several were located in populated areas. And, and, and uh, as they aged, um, the owners weren't willing to invest the money to do the safety upgrades, or there had been leaks from the reactor. Because um, again, it's a pool of water contained in it by a wall, and the walls can crack, and then you have the leakage of radioactively contaminated water in, into the um, into the nearby area. Yeah, here's an inside view of the Tehran research reactor. And the water, I mean, the person doesn't have to worry about radiation. I mean, the water produce, provides the shielding. The pool's fairly deep, and, and it, and it um, makes it safe to be around or on top. Henry, now what's your question? Well, the, the Tehran research reactors, it's run on, it started with weapon grade uranium. I mean, one of the things you want in a research reactor, you want to, um, if you're going to make medical isotopes, for example, you want a compact core. And 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 because in a sense, what you want is a lot of neutrons coming out um, and that come, that, that come out into a small volume and, and you get concentration of the neutrons that can then irradiate the targets. You don't want a large core where the neutrons come out, but they tend to be more dispersed. So you want to have the, a, a beam or neutrons coming out that can irradiate your targets um, that you put in there. So you want to you want to concentrate the core, make it small as possible. Um, now, that's done best with weapon-grade uranium. And one of the U.S. policy since the late 70s has been to say, well, can you have the same performance of a reactor in terms of the neutrons coming out um, with low enriched uranium? And that led to a, a long-term project started by President Carter, actually, in the 70s to convert these reactors from highly enriched uranium to low enriched uranium. And so we define low enriched uranium as anything below 20% in 20% in, uh, uranium-235. And so you often see in these converted research reactors that the enrichment level is 19.75. So it's just, just below highly enriched uranium. And the idea was you, know, you want to have the enrichment level as high as possible and then use advanced fuel manufacturing techniques to concentrate um, the uranium-235 in the fuel and then keep the neutron um, um, characteristics the same, essentially as using weapon-grade uranium. And so that has been done in many reactors around the world. This is the Opal reactors is probably the most advanced research reactor in the world for making medical isotopes. And so it's not, it's not expensive compared to a light water reactor to generate electricity, but it's a fairly substantial investment. <clears throat> and, and in the Iran um, context, uh, and this one uses low, en low enriched uranium. Um, and it's a, it has a, a light water moderator, and there's also heavy water uh, around it um, that's used to increase medical isotope production. Because heavy water is a moderator, so as neutrons escape the core, they're very fast. You make medical, again, I apologize for some of the tech, throwing in so many technical details, but the, when you make medical isotopes, 
you want to use slow neutrons that have been moderated, slowed down. When they come off of a fission reaction, they come out very fast. And what they found in a modern reactor is if they put heavy water around the outside, that actually there's neutrons coming off the core, and the heavy water will moderate the neutrons, and those slow neutrons will actually lead to a lot more medical isotopes being made. Instead of, because the fast one will just go right through the target and won't, won't irradiate uh, or make many isotopes. But if you slow them down with this extra layer of heavy water. And in fact, this is the reactor people have offered to Iran. And it, and it said no. Um, it has a heavy water reactor. And again, Henry, I'll try to keep answering your question as I go through here, but we can come back. Um, this is a satellite image of Iraq's heavy water reactor under construction. This is from 2009. There's, it's in, inside a, a dome, and um, there's a side shot of it. Yeah, and, you, and again, it's a very different shape than, than the, the beyond, beyond one or the old ones, but there, it also has a stack, which is a, which is a, an indica a distinctive indication of a reactor. Um, it's not, it doesn't prove it's a reactor, but, but if it doesn't have a stack, then it's likely not one. Um, here's the inside the pool. This, this they're putting in, we call this the calandria. It's just, it's a, I just call it a metal core. And, and it's going to be in a pool of heavy water. And, and the idea of the conversion was, well, we'll just rip all this out, and, and the West will supply you with an opal-type reactor. Um, and you'll have the, one of the best medical isotope production reactors in the world. And they just said no, just absolutely refuse. And what they proposed instead was, was instead of using natural uranium, they would use enriched uranium in this reactor. And that would cause, and I'll talk about that a little more later, the, that would reduce the amount of plutonium produced. And you could, by enriching the uranium, lowering the power, it's a 40 megawatt thermal reactor. So the young beyond one we talked about last week was about 20 megawatts. So it's a fairly large research reactor. Um, the, but in the end, they could lower plutonium production rate almost by eightfold, ninefold. Um, but the problem was this: they would do it inside this core structure. And in the negotiations, the problem was, well, OK, you would take the enriched uranium and maybe just use this part of the core. You would leave these, just have heavy water run through them. But then if one day you didn't like the deal anymore, you could simply take the low enriched or the, the low enriched uranium out and go back to having a natural uranium reactor. And then and this kind of reactor, because it's natural uranium, heavy water is ideal to make weapon grade plutonium. It's not specifically designed to do that because they're using the this ceramic fuel, which they want to leave in longer. Um, than they would if it was metal fuel, and, the, and the, you're, therefore you'll, the quality of the plutonium will, will get worse and worse as it stays in there. But they could simply run it, even with this, this ceramic fuel, run it so it could make weapon-grade plutonium. And, and we don't know, they were suspected of, of trying to build a secret reprocessing plant in the past. They've said they won't, but they said they won't forever. And that's also one of the problems in negotiations is they, they won't commit to abandon reprocessing indefinitely. Um, and they were, over the summer, they switched to taking the position that, that this core would be re removed and a smaller one would put in. And so in, in the negotiations, the idea is, is that you want, you want changes that are irreversible in an arms control sense. I mean, in an English word sense, in irreversible means you can't change it for, at all. In an arms control sense, it's the change is very difficult. It's not weeks or months, but it's years, where they'd have to actually, this reactor core would be destroyed, a smaller one would be put in that could not hold enough natural uranium to run the reactor. It could only work with, with low enriched uranium. And so it's irreversible in the sense they'd have to build a whole nother core to put it in. And, and other things may be done to make it hard to, um, to get back to what it was originally. 
and and this this I, there's been some backtracking on Iran on this. I mean, it was sort of wired that this would be agreed to, but it's unclear if it if it will be. But Henry, part of the answer is he on? He just lost it. He's back on now. Okay. Yeah. Part part an, another part of the answer to your question is it's very hard to tell the difference between a production reactor and a research reactor in, in, in many cases, particularly when they're these simple type of research reactors. And, and uh, they can be used to make medical isotopes. And, and in fact, if you look at India's discussion of its, what we would consider its military production reactors, its public discussions in its annual reports, they only talk about making isotopes. They never talk about making plutonium for nuclear weapons, but that's their principal function. So the research reactors t as a category are very difficult in proliferation. And because you can always make plutonium in them. In this case, in the Iraq reactor, where it could make nine kilograms of weapon grade plutonium a year if they wanted to, um, it could also really be designed to make medical isotopes. And so you, it's just a question of what the country wants to do. If you take a power reactor, Well, let me just show a picture of one. Um, you know, this is Three Mile Island. But if you take a power reactor, which is much bigger, a much bigger investment, um, you you have a huge disincentive for misusing that to make plutonium for nuclear weapons. Um, it runs on low enriched uranium, which typically, let's say a country like Iran, when you're talking about the Bushehr reactor, they have to import from Russia. If Iran went to make weapon grade plutonium in its Bushehr power reactor, Russia would stop supplying it low enriched uranium. And Iran is years and years from having the capability to make enough low enriched uranium for the Bushehr reactor. Um, it, it would have to dramatically increase its number of centrifuges in order to make just the, what's needed every year for the Bushehr reactor. So if they decided to make weapon grade plutonium in the Bushehr reactor, which they could do, um, the reactor is going to shut down because they will not have any more fuel because Russia won't provide it and they can't make it. And they've just lost a $3 billion investment that was built to provide electricity to the local area. So one can see if there's a big war, um, United States attacks Iran, um, you could see that Iran may think, well, maybe in a national emergency, we're going to use this reactor because we don't care anymore. It's a question of national survival. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll accept that, um, that the reactor will never operate again after we harvest it for weapon grade plutonium. Um, but it also argues, too, and this, that if there is a war, this thing will be, well, not this thing, but the Bushehr reactor will be destroyed in some way. That it, it will just be seen as a threat and there'll be an attempt to destroy it. Let me go through this and then I, I'm going to skip over the pictures. I want to get to the plutonium production part of this. Um, And I've talked about most of this. I mean, the, um, they're, the power reactors are to make electricity, essentially, sometimes to make steam for heating, but mostly the steam is to make electricity. There's common terms for these. There's the pressurized water reactor, the boiling water reactor. And again, I'll leave this to you to look at. Uh, those both use LEU fuel and are quite expensive. You're talking about billions, order a billion dollars, five billion dollars to build these things anymore. There's an, an older type that Canada pioneered called the Candu reactor, which uses natural uranium fuel. They didn't have an enrichment plant. They wanted to have their own indigenous reactor. And so they went with a heavy water moderated and cooled reactor. Russians built um, the, it's called the RBMK. It's, it's, a, it's basically, it grew out of their, their military production reactors, which were water cooled graphite moderated, just like the Hanford B reactor. And, they, and that became the RMB react, R, R, RBMK reactor, which is what the Chernobyl reactor was. It had some intrinsic safety defects in it. Um, I won't, there's something called breeder reactors, which, um, again, you probably don't remember this. When I grew up, 
nuclear energy was going to create electricity that was too cheap to meter, that it you know, essentially be free. Didn't turn out that way. It turned out to be quite expensive. But another dream is that uranium is a limited resource. And, and there's a, you can actually design a reactor that'll make more plutonium than it fissions. It, again, the plutonium would be used as fuel, which it can be just possible. They, then the reactor fissions the plutonium, but it actually creates more plutonium. And again, it's like a, a, a target system. The core is like the driver, and then you have depleted uranium around the sides and the top and bottom. And that's like a target, and you produce plutonium in that, and that you can actually create more plutonium than you use. And so this uranium that produces the plutonium originally <coughs> is then, um, the plutonium is then used to make more plutonium, and you, in essence, get the most out of the uranium possible. <coughs> but they've turned, the breeder reactors have turned out to operate poorly and incredibly expensive, so there aren't many around. And again, I just want to hammer home the point that weapon-grade plutonium production is possible in power reactors, but it's very inefficient and, and typically would not be done. But if you made, and just to review this, if, if you do make reactor-grade plutonium, you can still use that to make nuclear weapons. It's just not, it's not, it's not desirable. And then what I did in the slides, which you'll get uh, today or tomorrow. I just went through several, just pictures of several types. I don't think, again, from a proliferation point of view, um, these aren't the most important reactors. Now, what I'd like to try to do is go through, have a quick technical discussion on how plutonium is produced in reactors, or particularly how much, and, and give you some data and calculations of how to figure out some of this on your own. Um, now, one of the key things is that different types of reactors produce plutonium at different rates and, 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 and amounts, um, given the same power. So in a sense, they produce the same amount of energy um, in a year, but they can make different amounts of plutonium. You also can um, have reactors where they just normally produce weapon-grade plutonium. The Yongbyon reactor in North Korea just normally makes weapon-grade plutonium. Um, the light water reactors, the pressurized water reactors, boiling waters, they're going to normally make reactor-grade plutonium. But important point, any of them can be used to make weapon-grade plutonium. It's just the question of the cost. Now, I need to go f introduce a concept um, which is called burn-up. And it's, it's not an easy concept, but it, it really what it is, the underlying idea um, is you want to have some quantitative measure of how much the fuel uh, has fissioned or, is, or has been irradiated in the reactor. And, and so really what it's, you're measuring or creating a unit for is that how much energy is extracted from a primary nuclear fuel source such as uranium um, via fission, and it can be measured as the fraction of fuel atoms that are that underwent fission, um, or as the actual ener energy released per mass of initial fuel. And what we're going to do here is I want to use the latter one, so the energy release per unit of uranium. And it's units typically are well given in many different ways, so I apologize, but you just it, it's. We covered this before. This would be megawatts thermal, so MW small th. So that's a power. It's times day. So if you take power times a time, that's an energy unit. So megawatt thermal day is amount of energy produced, and then it's per ton of uranium. So it's in a sense you have a fuel rod. How much energy do you extract from that? And it's also, these terms are also used, tunny um, and just T. So in, in fact, I'll use several here. Um, it's also, this is not megawatt electric. That the megawatt electric, which 
gives you a measurement of how much electricity you're producing is not the total energy of a reactor. It may only be 20% of the energy or 30% of the energy. The rest goes off as heat. And the amount of plutonium produced is proportional to the total energy. Because again, you're talking about fissions. Fissions involve the production of neutrons. Neutrons irradiate uranium-238 and make plutonium. So the, um, so the burn-up is a way to discuss plutonium production, ultimately. Now, we have terms low burn-up fuel, and the values are 500 to 1,000 megawatt thermal days per ton. Uh, it, that would typically contain weapon-grade plutonium. Um, high burn-up fuel could be 30,000 megawatt thermal per day or day per ton, um, which would be typical of what's used in a commercial power reactor, of a pressurized water reactor, for example. That would be reactor-grade plutonium. So again, the low burn-up is associated with weapon-grade plutonium. High burn-up is associated with reactor-grade. Any questions on this? I'll kind of, hopefully, we'll cover this more than once. But it, in the literature, it comes up quite a bit, um, government dis discussions. I mean, if you talk about a reactor um, in, in many situations, non-technical non situations, burn-up can come up. And again, it's related to the quality of the plutonium and related to the, the production of it. It's not the only way to do it. Now, I'll come back to a formula at the end that's, that avoids this. Um, but here's, this is generated by the Department of Energy, and it's for the Hanford B reactor. And what it's doing is, down here is it's measuring the burn up from zero up to 1,000 megawatt uh, thermal days per ton. Here's the amount of plutonium per, and again, they use this weird term here, metric ton of metal. Uh, and I didn't define this, but this just, just think of this as per ton. Of uranium, it's the it's an old unit um, where they just want to talk about the uranium. Um, but in any case, this gives you the amount per ton. Um, so if you were at 600 megawatt, and again, this is another unit for megawatt thermal days, and this is metric tons of uranium here. So I apologize for all these units, but this is just what we're talking about: megawatt thermal days per ton. Um, if you're at 600, then the, you have 94% of it is plutonium-239, and, and, and you get about a half a kilogram um, of that plutonium per ton of uranium. So if the fuel was coming out of the end of the um, Hanford reactor and you were pushing it through at a rate so that it had this burn up, then you would know you'd get a half a kilogram per ton of uranium discharged out the, the back side. Any questions on this? I mean, it, I, I think I'd encourage you to look at it, but it because it, you can see as the burn up goes up to a thousand, it's no longer weapon grade plutonium. And so for this reactor, you know, the rate you push it in is going to be determined. You want to get as, in a sense, you want to use your uranium as efficiently as possible. So you want higher burn-ups, <clears throat> but you want to make sure that it's not, that it's at least 94% plutonium-239. And so this, so you pick 600 megawatt days per ton as your burn-up of the fuel. Now here, um, Yeah, let me just cover part of this. They call these normal burnups. So this is different reactor types. So here's that Hanford B, 600 megawatt days per ton. The Magnox, these are this is these are power reactors. So the Magnox, uh, which is uh, the uh, kind of a scaled up version of what North Korea has, um, it would run at about 4,000. Um, a pressurized water reactor is up at 40,000. And then here's the kilogram of plutonium per ton of fuel. And you can see that it, the PWR produces quite a bit of reactor-grade plutonium. So there's 10 kilograms of it. 
per ton of uranium. Um, again, that's in comparison to the Hanford one, where it's half a kilogram. And the Magnox is 2.5 kilograms per ton. But look at the plutonium. The, in, the, in the PWR, it's 54% plutonium-239. Hanford, it's 94%. So there's a real clear example where if you want this kind of plutonium, you're going to have to have low burn-ups. If you want economics, if you want to have good economics, you want high burn-ups, and you're going to have very poor quality plutonium. But you're going to have a lot more of it per ton of uranium. Well, per ton of uranium. Yeah, I think that's enough for this. I may come back to it. Um, now, let me skip over this one. So the, um, I mean, to wrap up, um, there's a lot in these charts. I, mean, I encourage you to look at them if you have questions. I mean, this chart is just saying, let's freeze the burn up at a certain level and see what we get. Maybe I should at least mention it. Um, you're just saying, okay, let's take a thou every fuel rod coming out will have a burn up of 1,000 megawatt days, uh, thermal days per ton, and then look at different reactors. Um, and again, the Hanford one, um, that's higher than what would it, you would run a production reactor at. And yeah, and so you end up with non-weapon grade plutonium. Um, the Magnox one, a power reactor, you end up with weapon grade uranium, plutonium. The heavy water reactor, whatever type, uh, this is more of a research reactor uh, or a production reactor, you get, you get 90, you get weapon grade uh, plutonium. And so if this one was at 600 and this is at 1,000, you'll, you'll get the same quantity of, or same type of plutonium weapon, about 93, 94% plutonium-239. And here, <coughs> if you took the fuel out after 1,000 megawatt days from, a, say, the Tehran, or I'm sorry, the Bushir power reactor, it's a lot. You're not. You're it's coming out at a thousand instead of thirty thousand, forty thousand, but you will get weapon grade. You'll get very high quality weapon grade plutonium, in fact, and you'll get it about half a kilogram per ton of fuel. So it'll. Um, so you pay a lot of money for that fuel because it's low enriched uranium, and and but in an emergency, if you wanted to under irradiate it, you could do that and end up with weapon grade plutonium. Any questions on this? How is it? Is it hard to, I mean, it's, it's very hard. I, I think it's very hard to understand this first time around. And uh, I th we'll probably try to come back to it. But it's very important to understand this idea of burn up and try to relate it to the quality of the plutonium and the amount produced. If you, for example, had 10 tons coming out of, of a reactor, if you know the burn up, then you know the plutonium concentration, or not, you know the total amount of plutonium. So if you know the, the burn up, you then know the plutonium amount per ton, and you know the quality of the plutonium. So you can just multiply this one of these values times the amount of fuel, spent fuel, and, have, and know the plutonium amount in that fuel. Now, there, there's another way to do this, which I'd like to talk about and like you to all do calculations. Um, and this is in the chapter we gave you on the SIPRI book, this thing I'm going to do next. Um, a lot of times when you're looking at the Iraq reactor or the Young Beyond reactor, you don't actually know what the burn-up is. They're not, it's, there's, if you, uh, for some of these cases, they're secret reactors. They're not telling you what their burn-up is. And, uh, and so you want to be able to still estimate plutonium production in those reactors. And so there, if, if you know they're going to make weapon-grade plutonium, then there's a very simple formula that can be used. But, it's, but it does de um, <coughs> it's really limited to the case of low burn-up irradiated fuel. Um, and it's limited to reactors that use natural uranium fuel. So it's not good for power reactors. Or where cases where you know the burn-up is very high. But other than that, it works pretty well. And, and I won't go and um, tried to point out earlier that the burn-ups, 
can vary um, between, let's say, a Hanford B reactor, graphite moderated water cooled, and a heavy water reactor. The burn-ups are different, but they both end up giving you weapon-grade plutonium that's about the same quality. So not, let's say 93, 95% plutonium-239. And yet the burn-ups are, are different, 600 or so to 1,000. To now here's the, the formula, um, is just this. And this, this is plutonium produced in a year. The first factor is just the thermal power of the reactor, the rated power uh, that's given to the reactor. So the, um, well, it's the total energy output of the reactor um, per year. And given is, it's in, the per year is missing. There should be a rate there. Given is units of megawatt thermal. And the examples would be the Young Beyond, which we think now is probably not getting any better than 10, 15 megawatts thermal. It was rated at 25. Um, most of its history, it was 20. The Iraq reactor is 40 megawatts thermal. And these are and these values you just look up. I mean, the, knowing it's 10 at Young Beyond actually is, is a, an assessment. Um, it's not by any means proven. I mean, if you wanted to just take the the, the nominal power, you take 20 for the Young Beyond reactor. The variable that's most uncertain and most Im important is the capacity factor. And this is the total amount of energy produced by the reactor during a period of time. So let's say a year, how much energy is produced, divided by the amount of energy the plant would have produced if it ran at full power that entire year. And that's, no reactor can do that. You, you're going to have to refuel. There's going to be maintenance. There'll be times when, well, it's not. If it's the rock reactor, it wouldn't be 40 megawatts power. It'd be 20 or 30. So the capacity factor is always going to be less than one um, for the kind of plants we're talking about. And typical ones could be 0.5, which means it's, in, in essence, operating at full power half the time. That would be the equivalent relationship. So 100% would be operating at full power all the time. 50% or 0.5 would be operating at full power half the year. And then it, and it could be 0.7. It could actually be anything. I mean, I've just been doing studies on India's plutonium production reactors. Um, and, and, um, and India does not talk about capacity factors. But they slipped up once. And, and I don't think they've ever gotten their reactors to operate above 50%. I mean, they, the, the, yeah, they said in one case, the highest capacity factor ever reached by their major reactor, it's called the Druva reactor, was 53%. And typically what India does, it talks about another factor called availability factor. And you have to watch for this in the literature. Availability factor just means it's operating. So the reactor is on. It could be, if it's the rock reactor, it could be 40 megawatts thermal. It could be 5 megawatts thermal. But it's available during that time. And so availability factors are what some nations like to talk about. And that can be 70, 80, 90 percent. Iraq used to do that when it would talk about its, its uh, parts of its enrichment program. Um, <clears throat> that it was, you know, it was on a lot of the year. That's essentially what it's saying. And if you want to fool people, particularly your decision makers, if you can pull it off, it's not a bad measurement. But, but what happened is people started to look at it. They said, look, we want the real thing. We want to know how much energy did you produce in a year. Therefore, we want to know your capacity factor. And so, um, and that's a, in the proliferation context, that's a tough one to find out. And often it's a, just an educated guess. And then the 365 days just says we're doing it for a, a year's worth of production. You could put in six months, 10 years, whatever you want. The last thing is this, it's a plutonium conversion factor. And it converts the energy produced by the reactor uh, into the amount of weapons grade plutonium produced in the uranium fuel. And in some ways, this is a discussion of burn up. But we're going to skip it in this case. And it, what it is, it's grams of plutonium per megawatt thermal days. And it turns out that for, if, for the reactor types we're looking at, heavy water, gas graphite, uh, so long as they're using natural uranium, it's always going to be about 
it could it could be zero point eight five, it could be zero point nine five, but when you consider the air possible in the C, the capacity factor, this kind of uncertainty is nothing, and so you can always just use zero point nine, and it won't matter. And so the in the end, um, it's actually a pretty simple formula to use. And let me give an example where I'll just put in the numbers where you have it's 20 megawatts thermal, capacity factor of 0 0.5, 365 days, and, and 0 0.9 um, for the grams per megawatt thermal days. And you get, you get this answer. It's in grams, 3,285 grams. <coughs> You're all comfortable with grams to kilograms? I mean, I, I, um, I, I, you can put in a div divide everything by 1,000, and you get 3.28, which really should be rounded probably in this calculation to 3 kilograms per year. And this gives you a sense of what the North Korean reactor may actually achieve. This may be more of the kind of plutonium it produces than if you, than if you let the North Koreans describe it, where they would probably use 0.8 or 0.9 here. And then, and then the number would, would obviously go up. So in this case, with a 20 megawatt thermal reactor, you're not actually, you're making enough, not even, well, maybe enough for one bomb a year, maybe not. So the, certainly from a weaponeer's point of view, you really want to get the reactor people to work on this. But it often is not that simple to, to actually improve it. OK, now why don't you do one? Do you all have calculators here? Or? Yeah, they're on your iPhone. So it's, it's, and this is this is actually a powerful tool to use in, in trying to assess um, things that are going on. So here, try this one. So this would, and this, so this was the out the. I th and the Iranians even use this number. No, that's the output of the Iraq reactor. In this case, it's it's in this it's in the mode where it's making weapon grade plutonium. So it's not a yeah you know, from a if you're a small state, limited ambitions for nuclear weapons, it's not a bad reactor if you want to go make plutonium for nuclear weapons. Again, they may not get the 0.7 capacity factor. But it's it, even if they get 0.5, it's going to be enough for probably two weapons a year. 